All right. Glad everybody here this morning. And we've been talking about over the last three weeks um, the foundations of how we are to rebuild or how, how are we to minister is the question. That's the question I asked our church council two weeks ago is how are we to minister now? How are we to minister where we find ourselves today? And what we have to realize is the early church faced the same problems that we face today. The early church was driven underground. They had to have their church not out in the open. They had to have their church behind closed doors because the threat of the world to take over was there. It was present. So what we have to look at is how did they handle ministering where they were at? Same situation that we find ourselves in. Now, it's not to the severity of, their, of that time. I mean, they could be killed because of their, their Christian beliefs. But we are headed there in the United States of America. And if we're not careful, we will find ourselves exactly in that place. You know, there's Christians across the world. I think sometimes we're insulated and isolated as Christians in America. There are Christians across the world who are dying daily because of their beliefs in Christ. They're dying daily because of preaching the word, reading the word, claiming Christ. They're dying daily. And there are factions in America that would love to place us in the same category as those places in other countries that persecute Christians. If a socialistic government ever comes to America, the Christians will be the first target that they take once they come into power. Because that's how it happens everywhere. You can't have a socialistic environment and have a God. The socialistic mindset is the government is your God. So we have to be careful where we find ourselves today. So we've already talked about how do we minister now. Well, the foundation of how they ministered then was we preached the word. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. That we have to continue to preach thus saith the word of the Lord. If you look at TV evangelism today, there's many people teaching something other than the word of God. Added to and taken away, tickling of people's ears so that they can further an agenda which basically makes them money. On the flip side of that, I said we also have to make sure that we are the foundation of prayer is key because that's our power. That's how we fight daily. That's how we fight. You know, we talked about the arbor of God is there for our protection. But prayer activates the power in a Christian's life to fight the battles that we face. Y'all fight battles daily? Yeah, every time we wake up, we fight a battle. We're on a battlefield 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But what I want to talk about today was that something that's not quite, you know, preach the word and prayer is something that we have, we've heard over our lifetime. Right? Many people have heard preach the word, prayer is the foundations of your Christian walk. What I'm going to tell you today is something that Christians are not practicing, first and foremost. I'm pretty much guaranteed most Christians are not practicing it. And I also guarantee that if you begin to practice it, it will change your life. When I begin to, to look at what God led me to, we're going to be in Ephesians today. Ephesians 5, we're going to start at verse 15. When God gave me the, the message, you know, I was praying, God, what, what should I teach? What, what is it that you want me to, to talk about? Ephesians 5, 15 through 21, come to mind. Well, I take my Bible out. I read Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. And clearly, a lot of times when I pray, God just gives me scripture. I don't know if this happens in your life. Sometimes it freaks me out. But he gives me exact scripture, not just read Ephesians. He says Ephesians 5. 15 through 21. That's what come to mind. It kept coming to mind. But then when I read it, I'm going, God, I can't preach a sermon on this. Y'all ever notice, anybody ever done teaching exclusively? There's some scripture that's easier to teach. There's some sermons that are easier to preach. Right? David and Goliath. That's what you can hold down on, right? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Jonah and the whale. There's those ones that you can just, you know, it's there. It's on the surface. You can look at it and see what it means. There's no trying to decipher. Because the problem is sometimes as Christians we lose context. It's context to everything. Anything you say in context means something. So sometimes in scripture because we were not raised in the environment that it was written. We can lose the context of it if we're not careful. That's how people take contextual scripture and use it for things that are not 
right because they changed the context of what it was written. So when I begin to read this, I'm going, God, this is, I, I don't know what you want me to tell these people. I, I, I don't understand. Now, you tell me this is what you want me to teach. Now you're going to have to teach me what I need to teach. Because right now, you've got me kind of lost. Now, there's some in the first portion of this. Oh, yeah, we can teach that. That's no problem. 1 through 15. Now, there's things there that we can, we can work with. But 15 through 21, you're kind of losing me. Because it's kind of weird. You're going to see what I mean. We're going to see where you shift. It's kind of hard. It's perplexing. So I said, God, what do I need to do? And very rarely, I mean, I do this a little, but not a ton. God said, I want you to go and take the Greek and look at the Greek exclusively. Because the Greek exclusively will give you the context of what it was taught when it was taught. Now, I know it's hard to do that. And it took a lot. You should, my notebook has about 10 pages of I went word by word and looked it up to see what the overall context. And when I did that, then magically the picture was like, oh, well, this is easy. I sat down and wrote the thing out in like 10 minutes and we were done. Because then it made contextual sense. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about buy back our days. That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about buying back our days. Redeeming our days for Christ. I never looked at this context the way we're going to talk about it. I never looked at what this is saying. I've read the scripture before. Many of you have read the scripture before. But I never saw what God is truly telling us here. When he says, buy back our days. Now, I don't know if some of y'all watched the attorney general testify before the house this week. And everybody wanted to reclaim your time. Did y'all see that? I reclaim my time. I reclaim my time. We're not talking about that today. But when I, I wrote the sermon before that. And then afterwards, when I read back, buy back my days, that's all I was thinking. That trial, and I reclaim my time. I reclaim my time. Y'all need to see that if y'all want to see something funny. How do you ask a person a question and then don't give them time to answer? That's not a question. That's called a degree. They were like, Christy, would you like a grilled cheese? And when you go, no, I prefer, I buy back my time. Yeah, that's what they said. <laughs> you got to see it. Anyway, so that's what we're talking about is daily. When we wake up daily, we're on a battlefield. We talked about that last week. So we are in a war, what? Daily. And as Christians, we have to redeem our days. Whenever we wake up. And I want to explain to you extensively what that means. Because I know right now you're going, huh? What is but when I begin to show you, you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. In verse 15 it says this. Therefore be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. Making the most of your time. Because the days are what? Evil. Okay? So then do not be foolish but understand that what the will of the Lord is y'all ready for the curveball and do not get drunk with wine that, that, that. Was that, did y'all think that would be the next sentence I'm going to explain that that's when I went to look at God and said God what? Where, you want, where are we going do not be drunk with wine for this is dissipation many of your texts might say debauchery somebody else said that but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus to God. Even the Father. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, as we read your word, I pray God that you will make your word evident. Help us to apply it to our lives. Create in us who you want us to be. In your precious name I pray. Amen. So as I begin to study this, the first thing I want us to look at is in order to buy back our days, we have to redeem the present. So when you talk about redemption, the, re the form of redemption that we know as Christians is God redeemed who? Us. God bought us with what? A price. Price we could not pay, but he bought us with a price. Now when I was bought with a price, do I now have free will? We have free will of whether I'm going to walk with Christ or whether I'm going to walk with the devil. Even though I'm going to go to heaven, if I'm following God, God truly is coming to my life. I get heaven regardless of how I walk. But I'm going to either be miserable in my Christian walk 
or I'm going to be happy in my Christian walk. Does that make sense? Every day we choose the path for which God has intended for that day. We have the choice of how we're going to respond and whether we are going to be joyful or whether we are going to be miserable. Now, there's many Christians today that are miserable. Have you ever found yourself in your Christian walk reading the Word and praying and still miserable? Anybody ever been there? I'm there now. I read the Word, I pray, but I am miserable. You know why I am miserable? Because we cannot do fully what we need to do in the ministry of God. And I feel like I should have something to do. You understand what I said there, right? I feel like there is something that I need to do. And I fail to realize that God is still God. God's God, no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what the situation is, God is God. God knows where we are. God knows what we need. God knows that we, God's bigger than COVID. God's bigger than the United States of America. God's bigger than the politicians that we have in the White House. God is still God. So that's the starting point here because he says this. Therefore, be careful how you walk. What does it mean to be careful? Y'all tell your kids this all the time, right? Be careful. Meaning what? As an adult, I have lived a life long enough to know that if you touch a hot stove, it will burn you. And as a loving parent, it is my job to tell my children to be careful because I love them enough not to want them to be harmed. So here Paul is telling the church, be careful. What? Be on alert. Perceive the environment that you are in when? Today. Which is going to be every day. Because we have to redeem the present. We can't live on what we did in the past. Y'all know Christians try to live with themselves on what they did in the past. I know churches that try to live in the, in the past. What we used to do. How we used to do it. We can't do it that way because we used to do it this way. Then I know Christians that try to live for the future. If God can ever get me here. If God can ever get me to this point. If God can ever make me comfortable in this situation. Then I'll print teach. Then I'll do this. And then I'll do that. But God's not saying that we need to live for the past. God's not saying here we need to live for the future. He's saying we need to live where? Here. Be careful how you walk. Walking is a verb. Right? It's a verb many of us don't like to use. Because walking means I now have to do something. It's kind of hard to be careful. In a bubble, isn't it? If I surrounded you with a bubble. Anybody remember that movie, Boy in the Bubble? Was that like John Travolta or something? Who's in the bubble? Who? It was in the bubble. <laughs> it was like in the bubble. You couldn't get in the bubble. He was protected in the bubble. You couldn't leave the bubble. What happened? You were protected. Christians want to live in the bubble, but a bubble can't protect you. So he's saying that you have to walk as Christians because every day you're going to what? Wake up. If you don't wake up, where are you going to be? In heaven. There ain't no need to be careful if you're already in heaven. Every day you're going to walk, wake up on the battlefield of life. Every day. Your pup tent is pitched on the battlefield of life. And when your feet step outside, you are automatically in the war zone. So we have to be careful how we walk. Now that's the foundation of what we're going to talk about. Because here's the next step. It's this. Not as unwise, but as wise. Now, when you begin to look at the Greek for wise, it's talking about being skillful in your service. You ever seen somebody that is skillful at their job? They know their job and they do it extremely well. I seen a guy on television the other day painting cars. And he was an expert at painting cars. I could have painted the cars. I could have used the same mixture. I could have used the same gun. I could have used the same building. I could have used the same car, and I can guarantee you my, my car painted ain't going to look like the car he painted. Why? He is skilled in his practice. So he says here that as Christians, we have to walk carefully and be skilled in our practice, not unwise. What does it mean to be unwise? For a Christian, it means that we don't have God. If God gives us our wisdom, to be unwise is walking by whose standards? Mine. My standards are never good. If I think something is good, I can go ahead and tell you nine times out of ten, my decision is wrong. If it's not seen through the lens of Christ himself. So he says we cannot trust our humanity. Okay? 
Keep that in your mind. We must be careful how we walk. We must walk in God's standard with his skillful practice in our life, not with our what? Humanity. Okay? You with me? Next thing he says is this. Making, here's the crux, the first part. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. Now, when you look up the Greek of making the most of your time, you know, we use this saying a lot, right? Everybody says, you need to make the most of your time. And there's, if you ever notice, there's a lot of things that people talk and say, definition-wise, you, know, you think you know what it means, but you really don't know what it means. You know, there's some words that we think we use in context that we think we understand, but we don't understand the gravity of what it says. So make the most of your time in the Greek is basically saying this. Every day you need to redeem your time for God. It's the idea of making every day count. Not for me, but for Christ. Okay? Keep that in your mind. Every day we have to buy back our day and redeem our day for Christ. Why? Why? Because naturally, by our own standards, we are unwise. True? We are human. So if I do not buy back the day for Christ and use his redemption in my life as I walk, I will use my redemption through what? My humanness. And then I will not walk skillfully. I will walk unwise. I'm building this for you in layers so you can see when the real hammer's coming. The good part's coming when it's really going to be like, oh, that makes so much sense. Because here's what it's saying. It's saying this. If we walk by human standards, we're going to fail. If we walk by God's standards and reclaim our day for Christ, we'll be successful. So when we get up, we should read the word. We should pray. And I'm going to give you the third part of this. I'm going to give it to you now. But it's coming. And this third aspect of reclaiming our day for Christ. It's waking up and making the decision that today I'm not walking by the world, but today I'm going to walk by God. Okay? The next part of that says this, because the days. When you look at the word days, it means from sunrise to sunset and to sunrise the next day. What does it mean? 24 hours. Then what's the next word? Are evil. Every hour of every day that you spend on this earth, you are surrounded by evil. True? So as Christians, if we do not redeem the day for Christ, and yet we redeem it for our earthly mind and our earthly standards, we are going to walk that day not by Christ's standards, but by what? Ours. So basically we are opening door, the door to participate in the evil that is around us and then we wonder why we're getting blown up on the minefields of life and we don't know where the minds are because we're not walking by God's wisdom, we're walking by man's standards. Make sense? So we have to redeem the present. The next thing is we, we don't need to relive your past because we all know that we're saved from our past, right? Who's glad they're saved from who they used to be? Y'all have to kill that old man regularly. And that's basically what we're talking about is killing that old man daily. You can't, because here's the next thing. He says, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Okay? So to be foolish here means that we are to walk away from God's standard. So every day, if every day and every second of every day on earth is evil, as Christians, if we are to walk wisely, we are to walk wisely by understanding the will of the Lord. So we have to look at everything through the mindset of who? God, not the mindset of who we used to be. Because if I function the way I used to function in a Christian, as a Christian, what's going to happen? Somebody makes me mad. Am I going to say, peace be with you, my sister? God loves you. Is that how you're going to handle it? If you handle it the way you used to handle it, you'll be like, what? Let's go out back. What'd you say? Come over here and let me smack you one time. The point is this. 
We have to make sure that daily we are walking in the Lord. Here's where it gets fun. And do not get drunk with wine. When that come up in here, I'm going, hold up, Paul. You done lost me. Now, we were talking about preparing our days for Christ. We were talking about walking in Christ, not being foolish. And now you're going to throw drinking in the middle of this whole topic. We all know drinking in the Christian aspect is something we should not participate in, should not take care of it. But that's not what it means here. What it is actually saying is this. Do not drink the cup of the world which leads to wrath. Now, if you look in Revelation, it talks about the end times. When the end times happen, the people there will drink the cup of wrath of the Lord. Okay? So that means you are drinking the punishment of what? Your sinful nature. Y'all follow me? Everybody follow me? So when he says, do not be drunk with wine... We all know that on the surface it does mean as Christians we are not to be drunk with wine. But what it's saying here in context is this. Do not get caught up in drinking the cup of the world. And what does the cup of the world contain? Sin and wrath. Right? The world will drink the wrath of God. If you look in Isaiah, it says the world will drink the wrath of God. Meaning you will consume your sin, and it will kill you. So now, God has said this. Every day you are to redeem your day in God's will, in God's purpose, in God's plan, in order to be considered wise. Now, if you are foolish, you will wake up, disregard God, disregard God's will, and instead you will drink the cup of wrath that is there for the world to drink, but not there for the Christian to consume. Follow me? Make sense up to this point? For that is dissipation. That dissipation is one of the words. Does anybody use that term? I feel so dissipated today. Yeah, that's how I talk all the time when I'm at home. If debauchery. Does anybody say, I woke up today and Satan's on me. I think I'm going to go out and do a little debauchery. Right? What do those things mean? It means partaking in anything that leads to unredemption or unforgiveness of sin. Okay? So it means this. As Christians, we have to wake up and choose God. But we cannot wake up and choose the world. Because if you begin as a Christian to drink the cup of wrath... That is the world and how it handles situations and the world and how they are functioning and taking care of your problems the way the world takes care of them. And you fill your big glass up of the wrath of God and you begin to drink that and then you go out and begin to be dissipated or go out and to live an unredeemable life as a Christian. You following me? Will you be happy? No, because now you've become what? Who you used to be. Now does that mean you can't be forgiven? That's not what I'm talking about. You repent. God will forgive you of those sins. You will come back into a right relationship with Christ. Then tomorrow you get up and you take back your day for Christ. That's how it functions. But here's the point. If you get up in the morning and you choose to drink of the cup of the world. And you live the life of debauchery and of sin. And you accept what the world's standards are. You will be miserable as a Christian. True? So you can read your word. You can pray. But if you do not choose to follow God that day and apply it to your lives, will you be miserable? Yeah. It's basically saying, man, I choose this drink. I'm going to drink. Remember, God even says this. Y'all remember this? When Jesus was on the cross, may this cup pass from me. What cup is he talking about? The cup of the wrath of God. God drank, the, Jesus drank the cup of the wrath of God to put himself in your position so that you no longer have to drink from the cup of sin. So when we wake up and we take the cup back up and we drink the wrath of God, what are we telling Christ who redeemed our lives? God, I ain't got nothing to do with you. I'm going to do it my way. And then you're miserable. 
God, I'm reading your word. I'm going to church. I'm praying. But you're miserable. We have forsaken the sacrifice that Christ made for us. Now, does it make sense? When I read this to start with, I'm like, God, this is going to be impossible to preach anything out of this. I think Paul must have been drinking out of the cup of debauchery when he wrote it. But then when you begin to understand contextually what he is saying. He's saying that very cup that Christ could not push off but drank from that very cup is the very cup that you have to choose every day whether you're going to drink from that cup or not. Whether I'm going to drink from Christ and the Spirit that's going to guide me or am I going to consume what the world has for me and then I'm going to get stuck in what the world has. Because the, the punishment of sin is always death. Now for a Christian, before salvation, that death was what? Hell, fire, brimstone death. But for the Christian, that sin debt that we pay with death is what? Spiritual death, right? Because we stay with a cup of wrath in one hand and our holy word in the other. And that don't mix. Because every time that you drink from the cup of wrath, now you've made the decision to live your life to your standards. Not the standards of God himself. Then it says this. Here, Y'all ready for the antidote? The last thing we're going to talk about is we do it with praise. How do you redeem back your day in Christ? Y'all ready to hear the solution? We know we need to read the word. We know we need to pray. But here's the solution. In verse 19 says this. Speaking to one another. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to move a little further, but I'm going to stop right there. What does it mean to speak to one another? Thank you. It means to fellowship with one another. Why do you think Satan is attacking churches by keeping us from fellowshipping? Because that's where we are weak. Right. We're going to move forward because there's, there's something else here. Y'all just stick with me a second. So we're going to push off our fellowshipping together, which is the foundation of who we are in Christ. Next, he says this. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns. You ready? And spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. What's the next thing the government is telling us we can't do when we assemble together? We can't sing. Why? Because Satan understands his principle I'm teaching you. He understands that you can't buy back your day unless you do what I'm fixing to tell you what the crux of this is. You can't buy back your day unless you start it by praising God. You read your word, you pray, and then what do you do? You praise God. Is that what it's saying? It might mean Christy needs to call Corinne. And when Corinne answers, she just needs have faith in God with a new word. Right? It means praising God in the presence of others. It might be Brandy sending Alicia a text and I read this song this morning and this is what it said to me. Because we have to praise God. Because the way that we function daily is by praising God. And then when we praise God, we realize what God has done for our lives, even in spite of where we woke up this morning. That's where we're struggling. That's what I told God. I said, God, why am I struggling? He said, you're reading your word. He said, you're praying, but you're not praising. Because I'm the one, I'm not fellowshipping in here with you guys together. And two, we're not singing songs of joy. And I ain't struck out in my back when I'm studying the Bible and went to singing. If I did, Melinda might probably think I'm crazy. She'd probably think I'm drinking a cup of wrath if I struck out just singing in the back. But that's the point. Because praise of God is a foundation of our service. And right now, it's hard to praise God by yourself, ain't it? Is it hard to pray God when you're by yourself? It's hard to lift up God's presence in your life. And praise of God shows us how God's hand is in our situation. So we can read the word and we can pray all day long. But if we don't acknowledge where God is standing with us, it kills us. Then we go about our day drinking the cup of wrath of what the world has, to, has for us. And we're wondering why at the end of the day, we are beat down. I said the other day, I said, God, I'm the pastor. I might should not have done this job. Can I get an easy year? I'm still asking God for an easy year. I ain't had an easy year yet. I think today is year two. The anniversary is today or tomorrow. I ain't got an easy year yet. And the point is this. 
God said, Blake, you read your word, you're praying, but you ain't praising like you need to. Because if you praise like you need to, you're going to see that I am here in spite of the situation. And I have power over the situation. Because the next thing he says is this, after he gives them the list of let's sing, let's praise, let's read songs for one another. Then he says this, always giving thanks for all things. Because praise leads to thanksgiving. And in thanksgiving triumphs in your life, even when you think you're getting dumped on. Because then you realize you woke up this morning. Then you realize you had food on the table. Then you realize that you have a car to drive. Then you realize that you got an air conditioner. Praise God after standing out there in the parking lot. Then you realize you might have to cut grass, but you got a lawnmower, right? Our thanksgiving stems from our praise. So if we're not praising God, we're not thankful. So how do we drink from a cup of, of happiness in God and joy in God if we're not praising and then if we're not praising, we're not thankful for what we have. Because we're not examining that in our life. And we're wondering, God, I'm in a situation. i got to wear a stupid mask. Now they want to put a face shield on me. Then they want me to live in a bubble. Now they don't want me to talk to my old wife. She's in the house. That'll be the next thing. Six feet. That might not be too bad. I'll just go to the shed by myself. I'll quarantine. Told Melinda the other day, I said, <coughs> I think I got COVID. I'm going to quarantine in the shed. Of course, she says, You'll have to die here with the rest of us. Come on back in. But the point is this. What? We have to praise God. And we have to thank God. That is a vital aspect of our walk. Reading the word. Praying. And praising. And it's all encompassed with fellowshipping together. Have y'all seen that common thread? When we talked about preach the word. It wasn't just preach the word to yourself. It's to preach the word to what? Each other. When we talked about praying, it wasn't praying just for yourself. It was talking about praying for what? Each other. Now we're talking about praising, and it's talking about praising the Lord what? With each other. What does it say in verse 21? And be subject to one another. Once again, he reiterates the fact that we are to be praising and be thanking God, and then together with each other, we should realize what he's done in our life, and it should cause us to fear God. Not fear as in, I'm scared, but fear as in respect and adore God. It's fear in the respect of how your kids view you. Right? Right? Your kids fear you for the most part, right? They fear to crack them. You got to crack them harder, friend. Harder. Here's the thing. Why do your kids fear you? They love you. If they didn't love you, they could care less what you did to them. They would hate you. They wouldn't fear you. It would not be out of respect. You know what kills Cole? I look at Cole and go, Cole, I'm disappointed. I make Cole cry. I, I don't make him on purpose. But if I ever say that, Cole, that choice really disappointed me. You would think I beat him with a bell. Why? He loves me. He wants to make me happy. We should love God and want to make Him happy. And part of that is praising and thanking what He's done for us. Because don't you appreciate those that do for you? Your kids love you. Why do your kids love you? You ever thought about that? Because you provide for them. Right? And you nurture them. And when they cry and skin their knee, you heal it. When they're hungry, you feed them. When they're scared, you're there with them. When they feel by themselves, you take them under your wing. You do those things because you love them, and then it grows a love for you through them. How can you? Why can you take a child that does not belong to anybody and put them in a home of not even their parents, and magically they love each other? Why? Because love's not biological. Love is learned. Love comes from trust, and then love comes from acknowledging that in the past. They have been for me. And in the past, they haven't protected me. So because they have done that in the past, and because they are doing that in the present, what's going to happen in the future? So I praise God because I know who he is. So what's the final foundation? 
We got to preach the word. We got to pray. And we got to praise. And we got to find a way to do that. And that's where we're headed. And that's what we're looking for. How do we do that? How do we do that now? Right? Because they're not coming in here. I'm going to tell you right now, I can go out in the world, I can hand out pamphlets and flyers. They ain't coming in here. Because the world has given the stigma that the church is dead. So if they don't come in here, we're going out there. And they can come stand in the yard with us. We'll do whatever it takes to make you comfortable so that we can hit you hear the word. And we have to do it by praising God that he's going to give us that answer. Doesn't it say to pray? When you pray and you think, you pray with thankfulness. You praying already saying what? God, I know you got the answer. And I know you're going to give it to me. We just waiting for you to unlock that door. So what do we need to do every day? Every day, we have to buy back our day for Christ. Because the world already owns it. The whole world is already, when you wake up, you like to pour a cup of coffee. Who has to have coffee like immediately? If I don't get coffee immediately, you don't want to deal with me. I know that probably surprises y'all. But I don't even want to talk. My head don't even function. I, I just want coffee. And I only drink a cup a day, but Lord help you. Do not interfere with my cup. Don't make me sit it down and let it get cold. If I wanted it cold, I'd have drunk a Diet Coke. I want my hot coffee with my Bible, and you give me time to collect myself so I don't kill you. That's I'm buying my day back. That's it. I, I need to get a coffee cup that says, buying my day back, and just show it to the kids. Even calling them no. When daddy goes in the back, I have to, since my house is chaos. So y'all ever had, does y'all's house have chaos in it? In order to get some time, I go in the bathroom in our back. Because we have a massive bathroom in the back. It's got a desk in it. I go in the bathroom. I shut the doors. Cut all the fans so I can't hear anybody. And that's where I go. So I'm in the bathroom with a cup of coffee at the desk. Reading the Bible. Getting everything done. And the kids know, don't go in there. Because God, Daddy ain't got Jesus all the way yet. <laughs> Jesus and coffee makes Daddy a lot easier to deal with. So I'm avoiding that room until he is prayed up and caffeinated. And then we can start the day. But that's what we have to do is buy back our day. And it's just not reading the word. And it's just not praying. It's also praising so that we can walk and not drink that cup that the world offers because as we pour a cup of coffee, the, the, the world poured that goblet. One of them shiny, you ever seen them old shiny king goblets that they used to have? They all look pretty like everything would just taste better. Satan's pouring you a glass full of what he has for you that day. So we're either going to place that in our lives or we are going to buy back that day through the redemption power of Jesus Christ who lives within us. And we're going to walk. And that starts by putting down your Bible. And by stopping your prayer, and it might be just raising your hands and saying, thank you, God. Praise be the Lord. Now, your family might think you nuts. If you strike out singing, they might think you're crazy. But it ain't what they think. It's what God thinks. And when you praise God, then you begin thankful for what he's done. And then you realize you ain't alone. And our, we're not alone. God has got this figured out. You know, I worry. I worry because last week we had 74 people. Prior to COVID, we averaged 150 in here. That is 50% of our congregation is MIA. And if we call them, we look for them, but they're MIA. They're not coming to either service because we keep numbers left. Then today we had 54 outside. How many we got here, Dylan? 77. Half. Half of our congregation is, I don't know where they're all. They're in the community. They're just not where? Here. And I, and I wake up and I, and I fear over this. I'm not fearing over numbers. It's not about, oh, well, we can go out and tell everybody we have 150 people in our congregation. It's about their spiritual standing. It's about where are they now? And how hard did we fight? To win battles in these people's lives through Christ. To have it taken away from us by a sham. And I'm telling you, it's a sham. So, 
Y'all might not be able to watch that on YouTube. It's a sham. So at the end of the day, we have to realize that God is still God. And if God brought them one time, God's going to bring them back again. And then we're going to rebuild and we're going to be better. And we're going to be stronger because God is galvanizing the Christians right now for the battle that is coming. And that battle might be here quicker than you think. That battle might be coming faster than what we as Christians think. So we have to know how to fight before we get into the battle. Next week we're going to talk about another aspect of the foundations of how we praise and worship God today. We'll get another one next week. Stand with me to your feet as Dylan plays. I'm going to dim the lights and get anybody a chance. You might say, you know, I've been caught up. I ain't been praising you enough, God. Today is the day we can fix that as he plays that music. If you want to come down here and praise the Lord, lift your hands here in the center of the song. If there's something you need to pray and leave here for God, move as God directs you to move so that we can move forward and you can be the people and we can be the church that God wants us to be. As the songs play. Let me dismiss this in prayer real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, God, pray that you'll continue to guide our church, guide our, our lives, help us to live up to what you would have us to live up to tomorrow and each day that we face. In your precious name I pray. Amen.